everyone. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to today's webinar event on international humanitarian law and cyber warfare. This event is co-hosted by the American Society of International Law and the American Red Cross IHL Dissemination Program. My name is Claudia Bennett, and I am currently the Clara Barton Fellow with the IHL team at the American Red Cross National Headquarters. And I'm delighted to introduce you all to today's speaker, Jonathan Horowitz. Jonathan is a legal advisor at the ICRC's regional delegation for the US and Canada. He has previously worked with the UN Independent Fact Finding Mission in Myanmar at Open Society Justice Initiative and at the US Embassy in Kabul. He is an expert in international law and frequently speaks on the topic of cyber operations and the laws of war. We are very grateful to have him here with us today. Before I pass it over to Jonathan, we ask that you please keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation and to send your questions via the chat function. They will be noted and passed along to us, our discussant during the allocated question time. Thank you for joining us today and I'll pass it over to you, Jonathan. Great, thanks, uh, Claudia. Um, first off, huge thank you to uh, American Red Cross and the American Society of International Law for hosting the webinar and for inviting me um, to speak. As Claudia had mentioned, my name is Jonathan Horowitz. I'm a legal advisor at the International Committee of the Red Cross's regional delegation to the United States and Canada, and I'm based out of Washington, um, D.C. Um, just to give you a sense of how I'm going to structure the next uh, hour with you, if I can get the slide to move on, there we go. Um, start off basically two parts, uh, an introduction to how the International Committee of the Red Cross sort of views cyber, cyber warfare. Um, at a at sort of an overarching perspective, and then dig a bit deeper into uh, the application of the rules governing hostilities in cyberspace. So really talking about uh, uh, the application of international humanitarian law to cyberspace, as well as some of the uh, legal and operational challenges that we might face. And then I'm um, uh, hoping that I won't be talking for so long to exclude the opportunity for questions and comments and a little bit of uh, discussion, which I'm really looking forward to. So um, in case you don't know, the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, a uh, humanitarian organization with deep roots in uh, international humanitarian law, uh, we operate in over a thousand countries. Uh, we have about 18,000, 19,000 staff, about a um, 2 billion US dollar uh, budget. And a lot of our focus is on both um, providing uh, humanitarian assistance to victims of armed conflict and other situations of violence, as well as trying to um, prevent uh, uh, violations of armed conflict, uh, violations of international humanitarian law, uh, protect victims of armed conflict and other situations of violence, and we do a lot of um, uh, coordination work with national societies such as the American Red Cross. So to give you a general sense of, uh, of the ICRC's approach, when, whenever a new means or methods of warfare sort of arrives on the scene, we take um, sort of a, a three-pronged approach. Um, first, we're going to look at what that uh, particular new technology uh, technology looks like in terms of development and in terms of its military potentialities for use in the battlefield. In addition to this, we're also going to see how that new means or method of warfare uh, could impact or result in potential human costs. Um, look at the humanitarian consequences, so to speak, of the mean or method of warfare. And we're also going to look at how international humanitarian law would be applied to that new means or methods of warfare. And if needed, we'd work with states and others to work on clarification and development of the law, in particular, if we see any important protection gaps. Let me talk a little bit about terminology. So when I talk about the uh, presence of new means or methods of warfare, for this discussion, of course, we're talking about cyber warfare. And the ICRC understands cyber warfare as operations against a computer or a computer system 
through a data stream when used as a means or method of warfare in the context of an armed conflict. And when we talk about cyber warfare, we aren't talking about cyber war. We're talking about warfare in the same way that it's used in land, naval, and air warfare to refer to hostilities that are conducted in these domains. Let me talk and reflect on some of the patterns and trends we're seeing. Um, there are over 100 states that are currently developing military cyber capabilities. Some states have acknowledged uh, using cyber capabilities in ongoing armed conflicts. And we know that cyber attacks have taken place in countries affected by armed conflicts, but it's important for us to remember that issues of attribution, who is actually carrying out the cyber attack and, it, and its nexus to the conflict remain unclear, which raised serious questions about whether international humanitarian law in fact applied to those cyber attacks or not. I'd like to talk about some of the distinguishing features of cyber operations, a few characteristics. So cyber operations can be used for a host of reasons along a wide spectrum of activities. They can go from espionage to the disruption, to the disruption or destruction of networks, all the way over to what we saw in 2020. It was outside a situ situation of armed conflict, but we saw in 2020, a woman in Germany who died from a cyber attack, which took the form of a ransomware attack, uh, I believe in a, a medical facility setting. Another characteristic of cyber operations is that they're often highly tailored one-shot weapons that are designed and used in very specific contexts. That being said, those one-shot weapons are also susceptible to being repurposed or re-engineered um, by those who gain them in their possession. An important characteristic of cyber operations is the broad variety of users or operators. Of course, there are armed forces of states that can conduct cyber operations. Also intelligence community members of states would use cyber operations, have the potential to do so, but also members of non-state armed groups that are parties to an armed conflict could potentially use them as well as individual everyday citizens. Another important characteristic when it comes to cyber operations is that they operate in an environment often of anonymity and secrecy within cyberspace, where it's hard to know who's doing what, for what reason, and how they're accomplishing the uh, effects that they seek to accomplish. That leads me to my next point, which is cyber operations have the potential risk of unwanted escalation either into conflict or escalating a conflict that's ongoing. You can imagine if a victim of a cyber operation is unable to tell whether that operation is espionage or whether that operation is seeking to destroy or disrupt or create kinetic effects, that that victim state, for example, may respond in a very different manner in ways that may escalate a situation uh, in a manner that the uh, uh, adversary did not intend. Let me talk to you now about some of the potential consequences or human costs that can arise from cyber operations. This is that third prong of the approach that the ICRC takes when new means or methods of warfare emerge on the scene. So one thing to keep in mind is that our critical infrastructure, which provides us with essential services, is very much today linked to cyber infrastructure. In 2018, the ICRC convened a group of experts that put out a report in 2019 that looked at this issue. They reflected on what um, the potential human costs are of cyber operations by reflecting on real world experience, although those uh, examples, many of them, most of them not from situations of armed conflict. But we see that critical infrastructure and essential services. Uh, are susceptible to attack 
or disruption on cyber infrastructure that includes services such as electricity, health and medical services, water, uh, transportation uh, uh, capabilities, communication capabilities, uh, and production and industry. So it's not hard to imagine when you think about uh, what cyber operations are capable of doing, how they're able to affect in very serious consequential ways our everyday lives. We also know from the example I gave, but also from other instances, that cyber operations can lead to kinetic effects that include both death and physical destruction. And we also know that cyber operations have the potential to inflict considerable human costs. Uh, this figure is from 2015. Cybercrime alone worldwide uh, resulted in economic losses of 3 trillion US dollars. Estimates, which are still on track, is that uh, in two th by the end of 2021, that number will have doubled to $6 trillion. Now, if that's what some experts reflected on um, outside of situations armed conflict to try to learn what the potential human costs could be, imagine how those costs would be magnified in a situation of armed conflict where the consequences would fall on people such as those displaced, the war wounded and others that may be even more reliant on uh, essential services that are susceptible to cyber operations through uh, attacks or other activities on cyber infrastructure. So reflecting back on what the ICRC uh, uh, has learned to date, we know that militaries are developing and using cyber capabilities, and we know that they have the potential to cause significant human costs and consequences uh, inside situations of armed conflict. But what we also know is that international humanitarian law or the law of armed conflict places limits on means and methods of warfare. And so while today international humanitarian law does not expressly make references to cyberspace or cyber weapons or cyber warfare, we do know that international humanitarian law in fact applies to how parties to armed conflict conduct themselves in or through cyberspace. How do we know this? Well, we know this because it is increasingly the views of states. We know this from the International Court of Justice's uh, advisory opinion on the use of nuclear weapons, where it says IHL applies to all forms of warfare and to all kinds of weapons, including those of the future. And we know this additionally from additional protocol one, article 36, uh, in which the drafters foresaw the need to give attention to the development of new weapons and assuring that they are used in compliance, both with additional protocol one and its rules, as well as the larger body of international law more generally. But if IHL applies to cyber warfare, let me try to clear up a few potential points of confusion. One is that international humanitarian law does not legitimize the resort to the use of force through cyber means. This is something that is covered by the Jus ad bello, by the UN Charter, by customary international law on use of force and self-defense. Additionally, the application of international humanitarian law to cyber warfare does not encourage the militarization of cyberspace. That I would say is more of a political military decision, not one that has to do with the application of international humanitarian law to cyber warfare. But if states do resort to cyber means during situations of armed conflict, international humanitarian law does restrict the means excuse me, restrict the choice of means and methods of warfare, and it protects civilians and civilian objects. So in a way, we're halfway there. We know that international humanitarian law applies to cyber operations in situations of armed conflict, but it remains to, uh, to discuss and to reflect on exactly how 
that body of law applies. So as I just mentioned, <clears throat> IHL affords protections to civilians and civilian objects against the effects of cyber operations. It does this in a number of ways. And let me just give you a few examples. International humanitarian law prohibits the direct attack, cyber attack, on civilians and civilian objects. This would include, for example, a prohibition on a cyber attack that targeted a, um, uh, uh, a uh, pacemaker of a civilian or a uh, networked insulin pump. It would also prohibit a cyber attack on the network of a water treatment facility that uh, provided services only to civilian populations. International humanitarian law also prohibits indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks, including cyber attacks. So a computer that excuse me, so a computer virus that uncontrollably spreads and destroys a network that's shared by both civilians and military in the hopes that it eventually hits something military would constitute an indiscriminate attack and therefore be prohibited. Military operations, including cyber operations, must respect and protect medical facilities. What that means in practical terms, for example, is a cyber operation would be prohibited one that deleted, for example, medical data. Additionally, international humanitarian law uh, places an obligation on parties to armed conflict to take all feasible precautions in the choice of means and methods of warfare to avoid incidental civilian harm. And I'll talk a little more about what that can look like later on in the presentation. There are, of course, other rules of international humanitarian law that apply to cyber operations, but I just wanted to give you a taste of what they might look like in application um, for the moment. Now, you may be asking, as you should, is it really that simple to, sim to transpose all of IH rule, IHL's rules that were made predominantly for our physical world into the world of cyberspace? And indeed, now I'd like to turn to some of the challenges that the cyber environment, that cyber warfare, do in fact pose for the application of international humanitarian law. And I'd like to focus on four challenges. One is a legal interpretive challenge about what constitutes a cyber quote unquote attack under international humanitarian law. A second is perhaps more of an operational challenge due to the dual uh, use nature of cyber infrastructure where things civilian and things military are intermingled in cyber infrastructure. There's a third question about uh, whether international humanitarian law affords its protections to civilian data, and if so, how so, and where you can find the sources of that protection. And then finally, I'll wrap up with some reflections on challenges, but also potential solutions to providing, uh, to, to complying with the obligation of passive precautions, which is uh, about how parties to an armed conflict must um, protect civilians and civilian objects under their control from the effects of attacks coming in. So there can often be a lot of confusion around the word attack in international humanitarian law. There is the concept of armed attack and the concept of use of force, which you can find under the UN Charter. This is these are terminologies that relate to the lawfulness of resorting to use of force, the use ad bellum. This is not what I'm here to talk to you about today. I'm talking about the term attack as it's defined under the rules governing the conduct of hostilities, that is attack under international humanitarian law, and specifically as defined in article 49 of additional protocol one, which also provides a definition that is widely accepted by states as a matter of customary international law. So here's what that article says in defining attacks. Attacks are acts of violence against the adversary, whether in offense or in defense. Okay, uh, 
that certainly makes sense traditionally, whether through muskets or mortars or air to surface missiles, it was readily easily to it was e readily easy to identify uh, what military operations indeed qualified as attacks under international humanitarian law. But with the advent of cyber operations comes the ability for parties to armed conflict to cause both kinetic and non-kinetic effects, meaning that some cyber operations may be easier to identify as attacks, while others require uh, uh, a look at um, uh, uh, or, or, or some raise questions or difficulties around the interpretation of which cyber operations indeed qualify uh, as attacks or not. For those of you who aren't aware, the Talon Manual 2.0, it's the second edition of the original Talon Manual, was put together by uh, a distinguished group of experts who sought to discuss and come up with um, uh, elaborations on how international law applies to armed uh, applies to excuse me applies to cyber operations uh, they came up with the following definition a cyber attack is a cyber operation whether offensive or defensive that is responsibly expected to cause injury or death to persons or damage or destruction to objects the icrc uh, would clarify as a matter of elaboration. Well, first, let me say this. I would very strongly recommend that you look at the full section of the Talon Manual 2.0 on its definition of attack, because it has a lot of intricacies about what exactly is packed into this single sentence right here. As a matter of elaboration, the International Committee of the Red Cross finds it important to always point out, which is in agreement with the Talon Manual, that the, this definition of cyber attack includes harms that are indirect and reverberating as opposed to harms that are only direct. But the ICRC position is also more, uh, is broader than the majority view from the Talon Manual in that we regard the and a cyber operation that impairs the functionality uh, of cyber infrastructure also to constitute an attack regardless of that, regardless of whether that operation requires, for example, a repair, replacement, or reinstallation of data. Um, now, how do we come to this interpretation? One, we look at additional protocol one, article 52.5, which mentions that neutralization is a foreseeable result of an attack on a military object, and that word neutralization stands next to the words uh, destruction and capture. So it is distinguished from, for, for example, physical destruction. Additionally, if cyber operations could be directed at making civilian networks dysfunctional, we believe that this would be hard to reconcile with the object and purpose of rules on conduct of hostilities to protect civilians and civilian objects from the effects of hostilities. Let me move on to the next challenge and talk about uh, civilian infrastructure. So civilian infrastructure is normally regarded as a civilian object, but it is also the reality of its interconnected nature that I had talked about, that civilian infrastructure may serve simultaneously both military and civilian purposes. In those cases where parts of cyber infrastructure do constitute a military uh, uh, objective, the attack against it must be directed against specific military objectives, its component parts, so specific nodes, specific networks, specific computers, and not, for example, at an entire network of computers that are both civilian and military. But if making that distinction, nonetheless, that component part still produces and provides services that are both military and civilian, nonetheless, something that we call, we would call a dual use uh, object or dual use targets, nonetheless, that attack is subject to the rules of proportionality and the rules of precaution. <clears throat> 
So under the rules of precaution, that would mean that a cyber attack would have to be designed and used in a manner that would avoid or at least minimize the incidental civilian harm that it is anticipated to cause. In relation to the principle of proportionality, it means that the cyber attack would have to be suspended or canceled. It would be prohibited if the incidental civilian harm anticipated would be excessive to the expected uh, concrete and direct military advantage to be gained. So again, the application of principles of IHL to cyberspace. Now, an additional point of emphasis that the ICRC always makes is that when assessing the proportionality equation, when looking at precautionary measures to avoid incidental civilian harm, that you need to take into account the reasonable foresee foreseeable incidental harm that is both direct and indirect, or in other words, reverberating. What this means, to go back to an example of a dual-use target, is that if you're looking to attack uh, the uh, a uh, communications network, or for a better example, uh, an electricity uh, network that provides services to a military command and control center, but it also provides services to life-sustaining uh, electricity for a uh, hospital facility. Uh, when you assess your proportionality, when you look at your precautionary measures, you have to take into effect into account what that cyber operations consequences, what the incidental harm would be both on that medical facility and on those people inside the facility receiving that medical uh, life-saving support. Let's move on to the third challenge and talk a bit about um, data. So our increasingly digitalized society today is made up of essential uh, data, talking here about medical data, biometric data, social security data, tax records, and bank accounts. Um, now, separately or cumulatively, you know, private businesses and government services could come to a complete standstill if data was the subject of a uh, cyber attack. Um, so the question is, does international humanitarian law afford protections to civilian data? And if so, why so? So uh, let me address this in three different ways. So there are specific protections that international humanitarian law affords to things such as the medical mission, medical facilities, also objects that are indispensable to the survival of the civilian population, in so much as data is attached and part of those things with those special protections, data is also protected. Additionally, operations, cyber operations against data that are designed or expected to cause death, injury, damage, the ICRC would also uh, uh, say uh, that also disable or uh, uh, impair functionality, as we discussed, physical objects. Well, in those cases, that operation would fall under the rules of attack under international humanitarian law. So the principles of proportionality, of distinction, of precautionary measures would therefore apply to that operation. But what about cyber operations against data that do not cause those um, harms? Um, the International Committee of the Red Cross reflects back again, as I had mentioned, the fact that uh, the disruption, the deletion, the tampering of data could bring private businesses and government services to a complete standstill and cause significant uh, consequences. Um, we also do not see how the replacement of tangible items, such as social security records or bank records, having those replaced as digital files should in any way strip those tangible objects of their protections just because they have taken on a new form. And so it's for these reasons that we believe that if there is not a prohibition 
on the deletion or tampering of essential civilian data, that this would go, this would be hard to reconcile with the object and purpose of international humanitarian law. But importantly, I need to add that very few states have shared their views on data and whether it should be regarded as an object or not. Let me close up with the final uh, challenge that I wanted to raise. Um, we've talked about active precaution, that is the precautions that one has to take to avoid or minimize incidental civilian harm when carrying out a uh, cyber attack. But what about active precautions? Excuse me, what about passive precautions? It's useful to think about not only how those parties must minimize civilian harm when they carry out what we might think of as more offensive attacks. But there's also the obligation that armed that parties to armed conflict have to protect civilians and civilian objects under their control from the effects of attack. What does this look like? What is feasible? Um, an additional consideration to make is that under this rule, this is an obligation to be carried out in peacetime as much as it is to be carried out uh, while an armed conflict is ongoing. And some of those experts that gathered in late 2008 and produced that report in 2000, excuse me, that gathered in 2018 and produced that report in 2019, discussed this and discussed what was or was not perhaps feasible in terms of providing passive precautions. This is an exhaust, this is not an exhaustive List, but it gives you a sense of what some of their thinking was. Are there ways to segregate civilian and military networks or infrastructure? What are steps that parties to armed conflict can take to ensure or improve cyber hygiene so that uh, essential services that are reliant on cyber infrastructure are not susceptible to attack and therefore civilian populations are not susceptible uh, to the harm of such a cyber operation. They also discuss the important consideration of whether in the digital space, there's the possibility for digital identification of medical infrastructure or things like creating a digital uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent emblem. So those are four particular challenges uh, that I want to juxtapose to the reality uh, that international humanitarian law does apply uh, to cyber operations conducted in situations of armed conflict, but there are nonetheless uh, uh, both legal, interpretive, and uh, operational challenges uh, that states continue to uh, debate and work through. Um, a few, uh, for those interested in uh, looking at uh, some elaborations of what I've talked about, I'd refer you to the ICRC's 2015 and 2019 challenges report, where we look at contemporary challenges of, uh, of um, we look at uh, legal challenges uh, relating to contemporary armed conflicts, and also that 2019 report that I've talked about with the title, The Potential Human Costs of Cyber Operations. Um, but perhaps uh, more important in many respects, is of course what states are saying and what declarations they're making on international humanitarian laws application to cyber operations during armed conflict. And the previously mentioned Talon Manual 2.0 does an exceptional job at really getting into the weeds of the uh, technical legal considerations that need to uh, uh, be addressed, be grappled with and to be debated um, to resolve some of these challenges and legal questions. Um, the main points for takeaway, one, can't emphasize this enough, international humanitarian law applies to cyber operations conducted during armed conflict. Uh, second, cyber tools uh, can in fact be used in compliance with international humanitarian law. There is not a technological problem from that perspective. Uh, it depends on how they're designed and how they're used. But nonetheless, as I hopefully described, uh, there are challenges for the interpretation and also uh, uh, operational challenges to uh, uh, applying 
the rules of international humanitarian law, specifically conduct the rules on conduct of hostilities to uh, cyber operations. And because states are at the uh, front of developing and making pronouncements on international law, the ICRC encourages state discussions around these issues at a lot of acronyms here at the United Nations uh, Group of Government Experts and the UN's open-ended working group that all address the question of how law applies and what norms and principles uh, should apply to responsible state behavior when it comes to international peace and security in uh, information and uh, telecommunications environment in cyberspace. And the same goes, of course, for regional organizations uh, where we see states having an opportunity to express their views there as well. So I'm going to, uh, if you don't mind, take a big sip of water. That's a lot of talking um, for me and give you some time to uh, you know, populate uh, uh, the sidebar either with questions, comments, any points of um, interest, I'm happy to discuss. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was fantastic. I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, the first question um, that was, Richard, you raised your hand early on. I was wondering if you either would like to put your question in the chat or if you would like to come off mute and ask your question. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm not very good at the at Zoom, but I appreciate the, the chat. This is very, very interesting, but it's one of those things where if if you can make some of the mat written materials sent to us by email, it would be great to follow it, because um, there are a lot of points here I would like to review and, and see. So that was my only question there, but it's it's I didn't even think about cyber warfare being covered by IHL. That's how ignorant I am, but it is it is covered and I really do appreciate it, the understanding of it. Thank you. You're welcome. We can definitely um, send out some of the written materials for you, especially the resources that Jonathan put on his last slide. Um, so I will head through the chat, through the questions that we have here. So the first question, Jonathan, is, um, but as you already indicated, that cyber operations are secretive, affording no means to determine the attribution to any state. So in that scenario, how IHL, so in that scenario, how IHL rules could be effectively applied? Well, I think I think this is a I think this is um, uh, an area of challenge as opposed to an area of um, of, of of obvious solutions. I mean. Depending on who you ask and what I've heard is that, you know, attribution may increase over time, depending on the understanding of what the uh, particular cyber intrusion is and trying to understand who's conducting it and why it's being conducted. While it may not be obvious at the initial uh, point of entry, it may be something that becomes more obvious um, over time. Nonetheless, it raises uh, uh, serious legal challenges, be that on whether or not, um, you know, attribution can, can lack of attribution can raise issues about whether or not uh, a cyber activity, as I mentioned, is part of an armed conflict, um, depending on who's carrying it out uh, in that rare situation where it may even be a trigger for an armed conflict. Um, and what you do about the phenomenon of you know, some teenager in their basement who has no connection to the armed conflict, but you, as you watch the operation unfold on your system, have no idea that, that that's the case and how do you respond. So very tricky issue. I'm probably just restating in a little more detail what I've already said, but it is something that um, states are grappling with. Some states have been more public about attributing who has carried out a specific cyber operation against um, their own systems. Uh, that's being received positively by many. It's a, it's a shift from something that wasn't necessarily as present, certainly wasn't done uh, all that much in the past, but we're seeing uh, states gravitate towards a level of comfort that allows for more attribution in terms of who they, who the victim state uh, thought carried out the 
uh, cyber operation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jonathan. The next question is, is location data protected under IHL, i.e. are there prohibitions on military actors mining data on civilian locations to plan attacks, either against those civilians or to avoid them during a targeted physical attack? Yeah, great question that I, I'm going to have to uh, sort of uh, 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 think on my toes on on that one. I mean, the the notion of espionage is largely um, accepted as a lawful activity. The idea of conducting an operation that is intended to be directed, uh, for example, to kill or injure civilians is prohibited under the rules of international humanitarian law, under the principle of um, the prohibition on directing attacks against um, civilians. Um, but I might take a hard pass and write that one down to think about that very specific uh, sort of splice of the scenario that you're talking about if I, if I understand it correctly. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. I can definitely send you that question um, afterwards. So I apologize if I'm saying this incorrectly, but Matthias and Diana both, uh, sorry, and Julie, are both asking the trigger for the application of an IHL is if the, the trigger for an application of IHL is an armed conflict and when slash can a cyber only attack amount to an armed conflict. I think it's just a bit more clarification on this point. Yeah, thanks so much. So <clears throat> as you may know, uh, there are two types of armed conflict under international law. There's international armed conflict, uh, a conflict between two states or more. Um, but it's a state v state relationship. And then there's non-international armed conflict, which is uh, between a state and a non-state armed group or between two non-state armed groups. But the idea being there's no state versus state component in a, in a, in a non-international armed conflict. Um, the requisite level of behavior, uh, uh, military behavior to reach an IAC, a, a IAC, international armed conflict or a NIAC, non-international armed conflict, um, is a different test. So that would necessarily mean that you'd be looking for uh, different indicators for triggers and trigger factors if you're talking about state v. state behavior versus, for example, non uh, state versus a non-state armed group um, scenario. There is uh, no particular reason um, given what we know about cyber operations and for example, their ability to cause kinetic effects, just as, as, as an example, no reason why a cyber operation wouldn't uh, be able to trigger an international armed conflict, but you really have to look at the, at the situation on a case-by-case -case analysis. For a non-international armed conflict, uh, the non-state armed group has to reach a certain threshold of organization. That's probably less important for this discussion. What's more important is that there also has to be a certain threshold of intensity of violence that has to be reached. So the idea of one single cyber operation or cyber attack reaching a NIAC, uh, it would be a harder threshold to reach for that, uh, for that reason. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. The next question is, how could we consolidate the concept of sovereignty with the idea of a cyberspace framework of regulation? Well, so this is an issue that probably sits more appropriately under um, uh, the law of sovereignty, the law of intervention, and outside the more specialized body of law of international humanitarian law. I do think, generally speaking, the geographically unconstrained expanse of cyberspace versus the more traditionally geographic uh, regulated rules of sovereignty, international borders, for example, does create um, particular challenges. In the Talon Manual 2.0, for example, there's a fascinating discussion about what this means for rules around neutrality, which if 
uh, not followed has inf implications for who could become a, a, a co-belligerent in an in a international armed conflict. And so there are all sorts of questions about, um, you know, if cyber weapons move across the territory of a neutral state and they know it, what that means for uh, their compliance with the rules of neutrality. But perhaps a more difficult question is, well, what if um, not cyber weapons, but the transmission of cyber information, such as uh, uh, information about malware is transmitted across the sovereign territory of another state through its cyber infrastructure, what does that mean for, uh, uh, for the concepts of co-belligerency and, and neutrality and things of that nature? So it, it, it does have an impact on our thinking for sure. Thanks so much. The next question is, how do you define injury, physical, confusion, or propaganda? Well, <clears throat> so what we sort of look at is when we look at um, things like rules of international humanitarian law, take, for example, the, the rule on uh, precautionary measures. The rules on precautionary measures uh, obligate parties to an armed conflict to avoid or at least minimize incidental civilian harm. And what that harm is defined as is loss of life uh, to civilians, injury to civilians, or damage to civilian objects. Um, when we, um, and so the idea of, I'm forgetting that it was propaganda, and what was the other term? Confusion or physical? confusion or physical. So in, in, in those terms, we take a greater focus on, uh, on, on the physical issues of confusion. Um, uh, you know, don't play as much of a prominent role in international humanitarian law when it comes to operations that are trying to confuse, I guess, the civilian population is what we're talking about or propaganda. Um, for, for that matter. Um, certainly there's the rule that uh, parties to armed conflict are prohibited from threat not threatening or uh, 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 um, threatening or conducting uh, uh, or, or terrorizing the civilian population. And you can imagine that uh, you can that, that, that a party to an armed conflict could certainly use, social media to threaten uh, and, and to, to terrorize a, a civilian population. So there are those sort of uh, more intricate rules that are worth um, considering. Thank you. And uh, we have another question that says, and in your opinion, what measures should effective state, affected states take to minimize the damage to civilian population Populations resulting from cyber operations, bit of a tongue twister. Let me just ask a clarification. Was that um, precautionary measures? We talk about it as passive or active precautionary measures. Was it um, when they're carrying out the attack, what uh, precautionary measures should they take? Or is it what protections should they put in place for civilians under their control to guard against the effects of attack? Um, Paraz, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name. If you would like to come off mute and uh, answer that clarification, you're welcome to. Well, let me try to give a, 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 a quick uh, explanation or, or a quick response to, to both, but they deserve um, a considerable amount of time. So, for example, if a uh, military is looking to carry out a um, cyber attack uh, and it uh, anticipates that there will be incidental civilian harm, as the rule goes, you have to take actions that would all feasible is the language, take all feasible precautionary measures to avoid or minimize that civilian harm, that injury, that death, that, that damage to, to objects. In doing so, one would think about um, uh, how to design the cyber attack and how to 
deploy the cyber attack in things that would, and this goes back to a little bit of what I discussed, that for example, would only direct itself at specific nodes or computers or networks um, to minimize the spillover effect of an attack on, uh, on civilians or civilian objects. Um, you may think about putting temporal limitations on uh, the cyber operation that's being designed. You may want to uh, uh, ensure it's cyber hygiene if possible to make sure that it can't be uh, repurposed or reused in a way that could have uh, negative effects on the civilian population. So that's, those are just some, some brief examples of, uh, of, of uh, precautionary measures when conducting an attack. When trying to protect your own in your control from and outside uh, from the effects of an outside attack, that that runs up against. I think I gave those three examples. Um, one of them being again that issue of cyber hygiene. Another one being trying to separate out and distinguish the things on cyber infrastructure that are military from things on cyber infrastructure that are uh, civilian, so that a uh, adversary doesn't have to actually address that issue. They make it quite clear, sort of, oh, this is what we're going to attack. We're not going to attack that. We'll attack the thing military. We won't attack the thing civilian. Thanks so much. So um, one more question. How would IHL protect interference in an electoral system? Does it have a role and can it have a role? I know this is a loaded question. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to take the typical um, uh, sort of lawyerly answer, which says I probably would need to to know more about the about the context. I would say the first point of departure is international humanitarian law applies to situations of armed conflict. So if we're not in your uh, hypothetical in a situation of armed conflict, then international humanitarian law doesn't apply, and whatever the cyber operation that you might be questioning, there would have to be a nexus to the armed conflict also for IHL to be regulating that particular cyber operation, as opposed to some private citizen carrying out uh, sort of a uh, you know, cyber crime uh, uh, not associated with the, with the armed conflict. So if we don't even get to that space, then we aren't even into international humanitarian law. That does not mean that that activity is unregulated by international law. There are other bodies of international law that may have a lot to say about that type of uh, situation, but um, that's at least one consideration that I'd think about if I was brought uh, a, a, a fact scenario of that type. Thank you. Of course, thank you. Does anyone else have any last questions that they would like to come off mute and ask? I, uh, it's Margo. Um, I thought I'd put my question in the chat, but maybe I didn't. It's kind of a dumb question. Uh, I thought, I, I'm sure I misheard you. I thought I heard you say that the ICRC was present in a thousand countries, um, which isn't possible. So I wonder what you actually did say, please. If, if I did say that, I did misspeak. Takeaway is zero and we're at 100 around. We're, we, we have a presence you. of around 100 uh, uh, in about 100 countries. If I, if I thank you for, for asking uh, if that clarifies it for others uh, listening in as well. I appreciate that. Thanks, Margo. Enrique, you're welcome to answer your question, uh, ask your question. Thank you. I have um, one little question, which is um, I know that um, opinion juries on the matter of characterization of data is not that much. Nevertheless, I would like to know the opinion of uh, Jonathan regarding which is the future of which, uh, how the data would be characterized in your opinion, like looking at the uh, layer Ferenda perspective. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna give a pretty unsatisfactory answer um, simply because I mean, you're asking the right question, sort of how does, how does uh, state views 
what's the opinion of your views, that's really going to be so determinative of, of what direction the law is going to go in from an interpretive sort of stance. And so, you know, the ICRC in, the, in, in my presentation, you know, I put forward what our position is in relation to the um, object and purpose of international humanitarian law, the notion that, you know, physical objects one day turn into digital files the next, why would that change the protection that IHL affords to, 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 those, um, to those objects? Those are the types of questions that we're asking. But to date, there have been very few states that have made clear what their position is on whether data, whether, whether data is civilian and whether civilian data uh, receives the same protections as uh, civilian objects, or a slightly different question, which is, is data an object? And so there's a, there, there's a lot of interest that the ICRC has in its dialogue with states to try to get a sense of what direction they're going, how they're thinking about this, because whatever the end result is, we know that cyber operations directed against civilian data can have significant consequences on uh, our everyday life because of you know our digitalized uh, society and how we operate these days. Thank you. Are there any other um, burning questions? If not, Jonathan's kindly left his email there for you. Um, and you also can, I'm going to put our website in the chat um, where all of our future webinars and past webinar recordings are located. But thank you all for coming and especially thanks to Jonathan for all of your expertise. Oh, oh, we have one more question. I apologize. Um, are cyber attacks on proprietary military computer networks, i.e. non-civilian networks governed by IHL? Um, so, uh... Take the answer I gave before about election. So if you're in a situation of armed conflict, uh, then you're gen at the general level, okay, international humanitarian law applies. Uh, then you'd have to take a look at whether that entity that you're speaking of meets the definition of a military objective, specifically a military object. And if it does, then it is lawfully uh, uh, it can lawfully be the subject of an attack as long as it follows all the other rules of proportionality, precautionary measures, so on and so forth. And so what does international humanitarian law define as a military object? Well, it's a military object. It, it's an object whose nature, location, purpose, or use can provide uh, 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 an effective um, uh, 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 can have an effective impact on uh, the, the sort of the military's, uh, the opponent military's operations and can provide a um, uh, military advantage as well. I'm not getting the entire formulation correct, but it gives you the, the, the contours. Um, so that's how I would, I would address your question. Uh, the answer is uh, probably yes, but you got to go through that that different set of step tests and questions to make sure you get to the right answer. Thanks so much. And as it is two on the dot, I will let everyone go. And thanks again, Jonathan. This was fantastic. Um, and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a